I'm trying very hard not to say panel of panelists, <laughs> but it is the right choice of words. Um, our panelists today here are from uh, varying backgrounds. Some of them are in indie, some of them are in AAA. Um, you're here to share the insights and inspirations with game design. All of them are game designers. So um, let me start introducing them one by one. <laughs> Let me start introducing you. Okay, so first, up on stage, can I get Sean Toe from Battle Brew Productions? Yeah! I don't want to eat everyone's time, so I'll do this quick. Next is Keen Tan from Riot Games. I'm making this sound like an esports event where everyone's almost, yeah! We'll have like fireworks someday. Like fires and like blazers and everything. Next up is Xuan Ming Zhou from... Um, I have my notes, my notes fail me. It's alias black, right? I'm, I, I failed. Anyway, and moderating for today is Jun Shenxia from Xbox. Everyone, give, please give them a round of applause. Hey. Testing the, wait, oh, why my There you go, oh snap, all right, all right. Okay, hey guys, how's it going? Good, 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 good yeah. Hey everyone in the crowd, thanks so much for coming for this talk. Uh, we are here with uh, three awesome dudes, uh, Sean, Chemming, and Keen, uh, all incredible game designers with long history working games and still alive, uh, thankfully, for our benefit. Uh, and we're here to hear from them uh, and hear their insights and their perspectives on uh, what it takes to be a game designer, what are sort of things that interest them as game designers today, uh, as well as kind of give some advice to folks who are looking to join the game industry about what, it, what might they need to think about uh, as they start on the journey to becoming game designers. So uh, let's, let's kick it off. Uh, first of all, I'd love for you guys to sort of share uh, a little bit about yourselves, who you are, what are you making, and, uh, and yeah. Uh, so why don't we start with Sean? Uh, hi, so I'm Sean from Battle Brew Productions. Um, so Battle Brew's kind of known for at this point, making Cuisinier, which is an action roguelite game with a restaurant. Um, it's out on Steam, uh, and it'll be out on other platforms soon enough. So we are definitely working on that. Uh, we've also started work on new projects. Uh, and I won't talk about a big one, but uh, there's a small one. And I won't say too much, but it's called Love in Tiny Spaces. Oh my god, please. I'll pass the mic over now. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone, uh, I'm Ken. I work for Riot Games Singapore. So um, over here in Singapore, we, I work on uh, Team Fight Tactics. So that's a strategy game. Uh, I predominantly work on the game modes and the events, as well as uh, some of the player expressions and cosmetics kind of design. Yeah. So, nice. Shen Ming? Uh, hi, I'm Shen Ming. Uh, a lot of my friends call me XM. Uh, I've been around for a long time, uh, around 17 years at last count. Uh, so I started in casual downloadables, then moved to mobile, free to play, then finally moved to uh, Grand Strategy when I worked on Stellaris in Sweden Woo! Uh, as part of uh, Paradox Interactive. Now I'm back home working on my own indie game called Glyphica, which is a typing roguelike. And it is an awesome looking game. So uh, if you have a chance, have a look on his Twitter page. Uh, but we'll get into that in more detail. So. Uh, just to kick things off, thanks for sharing, guys. Uh, uh, you know, you guys have obviously spent a long time working in games, uh, but going back to the start, like, how much did your education actually inform uh, your career or your journey into games? Because I think that's something that a lot of kids think about, especially as they're starting out. So, love to hear your thoughts. Maybe we start with you, Shaming. Hmm, okay. So that's a preloaded question, right? Um, so for me, I think uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because I actually found newfound appreciation for my secondary school math. So <laughs> because I, uh, uh, I, 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 I do a lot of the scripting and coding in, my, in, in the games I work on, even when I was working in Paradox, because Paradox is a pretty much a hands-on kind of studio, so even the designers do a lot of coding. Um, and, I, and, and when you are trying to find like a, a direction in 3D um, and all of a sudden all your, all your like secondary school math come in, you're, oh, cosine, Damn. sine, tangent, 
oh, this is what it all means. Finally, it makes sense, right? Like, I've been like studying these numbers for, for like, what, 10 plus years and I have no idea what they do and all of a sudden they just click, right? Uh, so that was interesting. That was really interesting. Like when all these um, things that you didn't think would be useful all of a sudden become important. Uh, recently in uh, uh, working on Glythica, I think like ma matrices also came in to play. I was like, oh, wow, okay. That's like a lot of things that I never thought it would be useful and it finally actually did. So... I think as a designer, one thing is just learn as much as you can. Uh. I think it. like the general knowledge usually builds up a designer, um, and and you never know where where you can draw inspiration from, especially when you're trying to create like new like mechanics or even like new sort of like narrative experiences in your game. Uh, you want to draw on as many of your memories as possible, and these memories can come from anywhere. So I think in that sense, yes, but unintentionally, I don't think anything that I've ever been in that was specifically game oriented was like particularly useful. Um, uh, but then um, most of the things that turned out to be useful turned out to be those things that you that were more general knowledge right, right, like, right, right. Uh, related. Yeah, that's so awesome. That's my experience. Oh, thanks for sharing that. I, 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 I think there's a lot to take away from that. Uh, love to hear your thoughts, Keen. Like, uh, did you have some similar experience where it's like you didn't think this would apply but uh, or is that more applicable to you given your job at a larger corporation? Yeah, for me, similarly, back to secondary school, I, so the subject for me will be Chinese. Yeah, oh, okay. I can't believe that Chinese is actually helpful, but wow. like this. <laughs> but not in the way that you might think, right? It's not just about uh, the language itself, but also uh, the, the culture, the literature. All these are very helpful in shaping the kind of experience that you want the players to see when we are creating narratives in games. Then uh, beyond that as well, uh, in NUS, uh, I actually major in communications and new media. Nice. Yes. Yeah. So for that, actually, it helps me a lot in pitching. So a huge part of a game designer job is actually to pitch ideas and to make them convincing and to uh, convince your stakeholders that this is a good idea. So in a way, the combination of both like, you know, Chinese and communications, those are actually a very good tool for us to understand narrative and be able to pitch narrative to people, be it the audience or the uh, stakeholders. So that's, uh, that's where I come from. Then... After that, uh, after NUS, I actually attended DigiPen okay. for a, a program that both Sean and I attended and Shout we made a to game together. Yeah. yeah, so maybe Sean will talk more about that, but uh, it's a really good program actually. All right, Sean. Uh, so, I mean, there's definitely familiar threads in what uh, Sean Ming and Keen have both said, um, especially both from like math and Chinese, because my Chinese was kind of crap in secondary school. And then you, you grow up and for two reasons, so like, um, obviously business reasons, you know, like China's a big market, but I think more nowadays for like cultural reasons, you like kind of want to think about your roots uh, and, and you're just doing cultural research in general and, and English only goes so far. So you want to find the, the root um, of, um, of a story, for example, and you, you're just not going to find translations for some stuff. So that's when you find actually all the really things you took for granted like um, I mean I, I never formally studied Latin for example but you know that, that's another language that, that comes up a lot in games and history so you end up looking at Latin uh, you end up doing weird research into like Mongolian throat singing um, and you're asking what does it have to do with games but really everything um, colour theory so really everything economics, geography, history um, all of that came in wonderfully useful um, because game designer is one of those jobs where you kind of need to know a bit of everything and everything that you know helps so even if you go something like uh, I, I don't know like what does uh, town planning have to do with games whoa it's actually really useful because how to funnel people how architecture shapes behavior all that sort of things uh, so my, my background academically is uh, actually quite similar to Keen's uh, so I did um I guess back then it was called MassCom uh, and I actually wanted to be... Um, yeah, MassCom, shout out. Yeah. Uh, so I actually was going to make documentaries. Uh, so I come off from a film background. Uh, but again, that translated beautifully into games. And actually growing up, I think games was, in fact, a better fit of a medium for me because I grew up playing games. And in games, it was an active engagement in the media, with the media, rather than uh, what you call a passive media. So um, having this new medium to experiment with basically was 
became my ikigai. Like, this was the best form of media and combined everything I love. You had all the great bits about books and reading. You had the visual component, you had the audio component, and you had the interactive components. Wonderful. Uh, one of the biggest things that I learned, so going back to like school in general, um, and people again take this for granted, it's, it's the soft skills actually. So I think actually working in a team, so Keen was actually my team member, um, and he's great to work with, but okay, I won't say too much about like other stuff, but there's, there's <laughs> like drama that you, you go through, right? And you, you learn from that. Uh, and in the end, you're making games uh, with people, usually, even if you're solo, you know, bouncing ideas off of your friends, uh, engaging with your audience, that's all people, right? Uh, making games for people. So again, who's going to play your games, right? Um, lots of, I mean, you have a target audience, whether you, you like it or not, right? So identifying with what they, they want and what you want and where the crossovers are, I think are really important in creating a game that people relate to and want to play and right. want to experience. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's no easy answer. I think everything that you learn helps both formally and informally. Um, and I think just pay attention to that as a, as a designer. Just be curious. Like, yeah, life is great. No, that's awesome. Uh, I mean, the one thing I took away from all of this is, you know, the intersectionality of knowledge uh, gathering and being curious uh, really does inform the, the nature of design as it comes and the innovations that come out of game design. Um, so that's, that's knowledge and the idea of what you guys sort of took away as you started on your game design journey. Uh, I want to touch a bit about awareness, about getting into this role of being a game designer. Is, um, is there, was there like a sort of sense of awareness that, oh, I know I want to be a game designer or was it like you fell into it uh, versus, or you made an active choice versus choosing a different role in games, right? So uh, maybe we'll start with you again. What, what, did, you, did you fall into this role? Did you know you wanted to be a game designer or was that another path and you somehow ended up here? Uh, well, I know I was going to be in games. That's for sure. And then it, it started, uh, <laughs> I started really early for me. I think I was playing like uh, Sonic the Hedgehog on the Mega Drive. Hey, shout out Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, it's like a really long time ago and I was playing this game. I was telling my dad, like, I want to make games. And he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. And no one believed me, right? So, and I didn't even know that there was a role called game designer because I think uh, back then, any sort of like um, information I could find about game development, it's always been like programming artist. Right. You were right. either a programmer or you were an artist. And I was like, I don't know what this thing called programming is. So I'm just going to be an artist. <laughs> Like that was how I wanted to be a game designer. So I kept pursuing anything that allowed me to draw better or like illustrate better. And eventually I think I got into uh, a fine art uh, degree course uh, at ADM. Uh, and that was sort of my first insight into how games were made. Because we nice. were involved in a program, program called Gambit. Mm. And then uh, it was explained to me sort of like, oh, there is this thing called a game designer. Wait, you mean there's a there's a role for someone who just decides how the game plays Damn. without drawing or coding. Wow. <laughs> so, so that was like a new thing to me and that was like 2007. So it was like not a lot of information about games are, is, is that transparent around. It's really difficult to find out like how games were made and not so many documentaries were out yet. Um, so back then it was a, like a revelation for me and after I knew that, I knew that I had to be a designer. That's awesome. That's, yeah. that's so, so awesome. I don't know if that uh, answers your question. No, I think it perfectly encapsulated that you, know, okay. you started off somewhere else and then you, you found this thing and you, you went for it. Yes. What about you, Keen? Uh, kind of similar, right? Like uh, most of us growing up, we never knew that uh, game design is a valid career. We just play games ourselves. And uh, for me, actually, I wanted to be an economist, right? I think I'm good at math, I can count. Uh, I wanted to do business and economics. I thought that that was an interesting topic for me in university. Then at one point, I started to think that, okay, it seems like there's a lot more exposure back in the days, like 15 years ago, where the gaming progress set up like Gambit, among others, uh, and DigiPen as well. So it started to feel to me more like maybe I can do game as well. Wow. So I started to participate in my first game jam. Uh, in uh, NUS, it's called Contrast. That was like 2007-ish. Uh, and um, it was uh, my first experience making game with a team. And turns out that it turns out quite well. So I'm quite happy with my experience. 
And then subsequently, I start to look into my uh, electives in my university. What topics can I take to reinforce my game design? So I started to take programming, scripting, being able to make my own game, doing game design Amazing. courses. Yeah. So and at one point, I also start to think to myself like, uh, I feel like it's a valid career predominantly because like we are living in a prosperous like first world uh, kind of like economic situation. So in this world, like entertainment is really the thing to go right. Like we don't we can just do entertainment and being able to make a living out of it and to inspire the lives of a lot of people. So I thought that that would be a very good mission for me, and I started to go to game uh, after I graduate and so on and so forth. Yeah. That's amazing, awesome, Sean. Uh, so familiar notes from the other two. Uh, my dad definitely made fun of me when I was ah. gaming as a kid. Cause What's new? He, he said something like, like, like um, cause I was playing on a, again, Sega Mega Drive. Yeah. Uh, so when you mentioned Sonic, I was like, aha, yep. I've definitely been called out for that before by parents. Cause they'd be like, uh, you've been playing that game for like the whole day. Uh, why don't you do something productive or something? I go like, this is very productive. I like finished the whole game already. Um, and then my dad was like, you know, like jokingly back in the day, it's like, if you could make money off this, you'd be rich. And I go like, hmm, let me go think about that. Um, so I think the seeds were planted very early on without me knowing it. Uh, and then I, I mean, I've been gaming all my life, but I didn't think about it as a valid job career until very late. So I fell into it because, uh, and it's funny we're here, right, at TableCon, uh, Table Conquest, because um, I sort of opened my eyes to it by designing a board game so I was, uh, nice. I went overseas for, for university. I did poly here. Uh, then I did army. Then I went to Australia. Uh, and there was this like board game competition. And I was like, oh, let's just do it for fun. Uh, so I made a game about baking, um, of all things. Because um, I, was, I was cooking and baking a lot in Australia. I love, I love food, but that explains cuisine, right? So um, I made a game about baking. And then lo and behold, I came in champion. And I was like, what, what, what what's going on? Damn. Um, and then got a lot of free stuff. Like, well, I got free games and I got money. Like, this is, this is cool. Um, and then I was, you know, so I graduated with like a, a degree. Like I said, I was going to maybe shoot documentaries, right? But after I was like winning like free games by making game, then you're just like, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. There's, there's, there's other ways to make money. Uh, and the timing was so great that um, uh, back in Singapore, DigiPen was just starting up. And this is like government... Uh, backed like conversion course and that's where I met Keen uh, and then I guess uh, we had a generally great time there but like I said we learned many things about ourselves and teammates and how to deal with people um, and made a really cool game too while we were there and then came out uh, valedictorian yep. damn yeah. valedictorian uh, um, and then and then that started my career formally and then um I, I was thinking about where to go and, and Keen went to uh, nice big corporations like, well, he chose Ubisoft. He chose Ubisoft. And um, I thought to myself, oh my God, where do I go? And uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this on stage, but here we are. Uh, there was a cool Japanese company making mobile games and there were like cute cosplayers there. So I followed my heart and went to the Japanese it's company. It's always, always good to follow your heart. So, so that's what I did. I followed my heart and uh, ended up formally in games. Okay, that's... That's so awesome. Um, the one thing I took away from all of you guys, though, is that you were really relatively proactive about uh, the act of becoming a game person because, you know, you obviously started off, like, working in the illustration side of things, doing art, and then, uh, then transitioned slowly into games. You did game jams and participated in a lot of stuff, and similarly, you made a board game that got you to a place. And I feel like... Um, one thing that a lot of uh, the new generation uh, needs to realize is unlike other fields or industries potentially or other like traditional so-called jobs, it's, you don't necessarily fall into it. It's not like an uh, easy pathway from graduate from your course and then end up at a banking job or a finance department of a large corporation. You sort of have to get your hands dirty and like you gotta, you got to understand the nature of what you're building because that's uh, the, the work, right? Is that would you would you agree that's kind of how it is? Um, I think the weird thing here is, I mean, you you can approach it that way, and that's I think the very weirdly professional way to do it. But um, so we are just I mean we're at a cool event, but there's other cool events as well, right? So um, there's a lot of people, in fact, here at TableCon, 
uh, who are volunteering, right? Yep. No, no money involved, just for the love of the game, quite literally. Um, and I think for some of those people, and including me actually, like I didn't, at the start at least, I, I didn't think of any professional moves. Yep. I, I just I just did it because I, I liked it. Loved it, yeah. Right. So I think uh, when when example, if you go to it, um, like like say a lot of the people playing games here or like setting up stuff or making their own indie attempts, uh, or if you've got a booth and you're like selling doujin or 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 original art, all all of that's great. And I think. It's actually important, uh, weirdly, to not just treat it professionally. It's yes. not. It's not a burden. Uh, it's from a place of you love what you're doing, and I think that's important. Like, if you're not having fun, then I think it's harder to keep the flame alive. So, I think like like even even now, like especially now, like I'm I'm still very excited about games. So like, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm here to like play games after like like the talk, right? But. At night, I'm gonna go home and Elden Ring, Shadow of the Church, Woo! so that DLC's out. So yeah, um, so yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's not bad. You can live, you can live a life that you you want. And I think that was like the greatest revelation for me. I'm I'm really happy because like you're surrounded by people whose work you admire, and like you you like them both personally and professionally. Uh, everybody ma- is making cool shit that you're like, man, I wish I thought of that. Yeah, like, yeah, shout yeah, out yeah. to his game. Like, yeah. Really cool idea. Um, and, and yeah, like, like everybody has this inner passion. Inner passion. Yeah. Uh, and it's actually, I think, more common than, uh, than we think. So I think for a lot of people, it's, it's actually just like continue. Um, if you have a hobby, uh, like, you know, games is your hobby or something. Uh, that, that, that's, that's basically how I started. Like, uh, he mentioned Sonic, so I was like drawing Sonic, like enemy robots when I was young, because you know they're all animal based, right? And you just go like, oh, but there's this chompy fish, yeah, but there's no eel thing yet. What if I draw an eel? Then it's like got multi parts, and and you know, like to to me back then it's play, right? But that's actually a lot of the day job nowadays. Is that yeah yeah yeah? yeah. So uh, what what cool shit? excites you yeah what makes your heart doki doki <laughs> um, to be very weeb about it right um, so yeah I, I think if if it's you, you got to find what honestly makes your heart beat yep um, and I think that actually ironically makes the work a lot easier for sure speaking of what it, oh sorry you, you have a build on that yeah and then just just like uh, because I, I agree with everything like Sean says it's like I, I, I still have all my um, well I think if I dig it up I, uh, my jotter book was just full of sonic levels yeah, I was just like designing Sonic levels. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. In, the, in the the square square books, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. You got to draw the levels. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I had I like so this. much fun. It was to, to me, it was like just entirely passion driven. But I just want to add a point: is like I think one of the reasons why it's so difficult to stumble into games in Singapore is because our game industry isn't that uh, established. Um, and it's even though it's been here about for a while, it isn't doesn't it doesn't it's not as structured as uh, somewhere like in Sweden. Because when I work there, right, people do stumble into games. Like it is like a career path that was that is presented to you when uh, in their in, our, in their equivalent of secondary school uh, gymnasium and like they they can actually plan for a career in games because a career like uh, in Sweden uh, the games is their second largest export for wow. the country so there's it's actually a lot of people actually plan around a career in games like being a programmer being an artist and and I don't like I, I think it's it's kind of interesting because. The end goal for any industry is to reach a stage where people can treat, like they have the option to treat games as labor. In a way, like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like yeah, because for us, we are a self-filtering like, uh, industry because we don't have like these like set pipes to feed talent into the industry. Uh, so whoever actually ends up here, right, always ends up being ultra passionate. <laughs> well, actually, so that statement, actually, I think we, we currently do have these formal pipelines. Okay, yeah, yeah. But again, I think there's a correlation, I won't say causation, um, of, of passion and personal projects right. uh, with your professional skill level. That's right. That's so right. I, I, can't, I can't say there's a causation. I have no formal proof, but uh, just as an, as an aside, right? So like in Battle Brew, uh, a trend that we notice is that a lot of the artists in, in our company are also boothers at events. Oh, yeah. So we, we have a lot of like people who have their own independent indie brands. And actually, that's a, honestly a way that we scout as well. So uh, our lead artist, Mishi, uh, I've, I've always liked her stuff even before we 
we got to work with her. Shout out to her art, man. Yeah, it's so very good. Um, there's there's a lot of um, friends that you notice, uh, and you know them from like the fan or informal community, and you respect their skills before you even know what their real life name might be. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's that's part of the joy yeah. of, of it. The the Weirdly, the professional part of games can be very dry, uh, very doujin, very yeah. underground in that way. Uh, so if you if you know the the spaces to be at, which is he here's one of them, uh, then you, well, you're in, you're in good hands. Yeah, I mean we we can definitely talk forever about the ecosystem and the infrastructure, but we're not going to touch on that just yet because we're here to talk about you guys. Uh, and and I just want to. Uh, go back to what you guys were talking about, like inspiration and passion and like excite stuff that excites you. Uh, let's 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 get into that. Like, I mean, you know, today's industry is pretty damn cool, actually. Despite all the the stuff that's going on and the layoffs and like the severity of the the economy, I do think that games today seem to be in an exciting place as far as the games that come out. Because things like Bellatro and Vampire Survivors, things that just blow up out of nowhere, but they also bring a level of innovation to game design that we haven't seen before, right? Uh, and people lament, oh, it's all triple A's, but it not really is, I don't feel. And so I just love to get touch on like what excites you as game designers in terms of what you're seeing in the market today, what types of games you like, and what type of like mechanics or innovations you're, you, you're, you're, you're excited by. Why don't we start with you, Keen? Like, as someone who works on TFT, I'm sure you guys are absorbing a ton of things that's going on out there. I mean, that's the way TFT was developed. Uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about what excites you personally. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Balantro, so obviously we play that a lot. It's a roguelike. Yeah. For those who don't know, it's a roguelike uh, poker game where you can play with cheating hands and win. S yeah, so it's super super fun actually. So let me see where should I start up. Uh, I guess I wanted to say a comment about like, I, one thing I realized in Riot is that I want to say the Riot designers are obsessed with roguelikes. But I'm going to open it up. I think that all designers are obsessed with roguelikes. I know. It's the Hades <laughs> syndrome. Yeah, it's a, I think way before Hades, right? Since Rogue sure. Legacy, sure. since uh, uh, the, uh, Bad in the Days, right? Like, no. Even when we were playing, uh, we make, make our project, we were heavily inspired by roguelike games. And there's something about roguelike games that is very interesting. With all the mechanics they come out with, the system interacting with each other, how can it become a very coherent experience for players to play, experiment with something new, keep playing? Endlessly. Endlessly, yeah. So that is uh, very inspiring for a lot of uh, developers. But one thing that I find curious is that there's actually not really a triple A project that is roguelike. There is something that is not so successful in the triple A space. I think that largely it has to do with like triple A projects are actually normally a production uh, factory. Right, there's a bottom line to me, there is a clear goal that they are doing, clear target audience they are trying to hit. Most of it doesn't really hit in the innovation space of the roguelike uh, genre. So, um, which is why I think that a lot of the professional designers turns to play indie games that are roguelikes, because that is where they find joy and things that they really like to do and experiment with. The other interesting thing I want to point out about Balantro is also where TFT started. Like TFT uh, started from Dota Auto Chess, and this is the game that is based off uh, Mahjong, if you read the developer's interview. Yes. And even my favorite game right now, like Marvel Snap, is also based off loosely of Texas Hold'em, where you have your river cards right. that open and you place your bets to double or, or nothing. So one thing that actually innovation can come from is really to take uh, our modern game digital technology or ideas and we can turn traditional uh, big gambling game or traditional game like chess or Wei Qi, turn it to something that is... Uh, more modern, modernize the mechanic, make it appeal to the modern people, the modern uh, kids, uh, or, or just like people in general and society. So that is also another point of um, reason why I like Balitro and play quite a bit. I love that. I, I mean, personally, I think there's something pristine about the ideals of like these traditional games that, you know, they're perfect, so to speak, because they've been designed in such a way that they're they can be played forever as they have been. And now we are building new layers on top of it that like sort of push the conversation forward but doesn't detract from the base experience. I mean, the guy who made Bellatro, uh, coincidentally, apparently never played poker in his life, but the mechanics of it was so perfect that he could design a game around it that is now blown up. I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts on what, what inspires you, what oh, excites you. I mean, while we're on the topic of Bellatro, I think he was interviewed and, and, and it was the same feeling I got when I played it, right? right? So it was... Um, uh, he was saying like it wasn't it didn't come from 
from poker came out from Tai Ti. Oh my god! And I was yes. like, yeah, exactly. I was like, playing this game. This is not poker. This is Tai Ti. What? It's like, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. and he he did say that it was from Tai Ti. It was um, and it's it very interesting, like the way he's 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 he's, he's done it. And I think. We are seeing it throughout the industry right now, and uh, like we said before, like a lot of people say, like, "Oh, it's a triple A industry." I, I actually, I disagree. I disagree. I think this is the p- perfect time to to make interesting games because, right, there is no gatekeeping. Yep. To yep. any sort of ideas that you might want to push out, because there are streamers, who, like for example, like Belacho was largely uh, promoted by Northern Lion, a streamer. That's uh, right. Who plays it obsessively on the stream, um, and then his followers started playing it, and then that got the ball rolling. And I think like that is going to be just be the start. I think there's a lot of like um, other games that have like sprung out of nowhere. I mean, Vampire Survivors was something earlier, but like now there's this whole sort of wave of like cozy games sure yeah no, where that's right. you have like uh, games that have, don't really have like a fixed winning mechanic they just allow you to go inside and play with stuff um, that's exploding um, so th- if you look at Steam like every day you see new games coming up on like new and popular yes. and those games are earning like a really good amount and uh, that allows them to make their next game and next game so I think like right now the infrastructure is there if you want to do interesting games you don't have to stick to the the, the, the the common formulas and in fact if you do stick to the common formulas it actually might work against you because then you're comparing yourself to like people who came before and just have to like make it like better and better and better but like if you make something that's really different people like treat it as a class of its own and then you get uh, a, a little bit like um, less comparison with other games that's awesome I think that's kind of interesting yeah yeah um Oh, going round. Sorry, like I, I tend to digress. So going back to the idea of inspiration. Yeah. I actually draw less inspiration from like games these days. I think like I, I get more a lot more inspiration just from like going out there and doing things. Uh, like um, I think um, a lot of the, a lot of the 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 art. Like if you if you played my uh, my 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 indie game Glyphica, like the visuals actually came from Chinese ink paintings. Oh, that's sick. So that's where like it like it came from. Like uh, there were a lot of games that's obviously done it, but I wanted to do something that was even more minimalist than them. So like no ink strokes, no nothing, just like the the basic sort of like aesthetics of it. Uh, and that's where like the original idea of that of that aesthetic came from. Um, I think that is for me something that's a little bit different as I got older. Like I, I, I do play a lot of games, but I'm not like particularly into any one genre. I play a lot of games for like maybe 30 minutes to an hour. And then that's, that first 30 minutes to an hour is when I get my most uh, enjoyment. Like I'm not a completionist. I, I get excited by new mechanics. For sure. For so sure. whenever I, I, I look at games, I tend to look at whether or not they offer an experience that has, isn't seen anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, so um, it's it's like whenever I get that, I will tend to like play the game for like an hour, and be like absorb all the mechanics, be like this is great, and then I'll then uninstall yeah. the game and move on. Yeah, so, I mean as a gamer, it's just like a massive buffet, right? It's like a smorgasbord. Uh, you can just try anything and everything at once, and hey, heck, I mean there's even Game Pass, right? Shout out to Game Pass. You know, it lets you play stuff and try all sorts of things for free. So uh, love all that. So Sean, what about you? Um, actually, really interesting hearing uh, from Keen and Shenming because actually some of my approaches are opposite from Shenming. Oh. Um, so, I mean, I'll just talk about like, like he talked about like trying out a buffet of games. So I definitely do that as well. But where my fascination is, is when I find myself hooked to a game. Mm. So for me, the, the, the true joy is when like, I haven't slept in the <laughs> last 48 hours somehow. Uh, and then... And then that to me is like the, I have found something truly precious. Um, and I think for me, it's finding joy in the small things, right? Um, not to say that I don't support an innovation, I definitely do. But like, I think some people um, overrate uh, originality. I know a spicy statement, right? But um, if you look at like what a lot of like, gamers in general so I'm not saying you're an Altia or whatever right but uh, and I put myself in, in this group like I'm more of like a regular gamer a normie I'm gonna go, go home I, I, I had a tough day at work or something and I want to play something fun um, like I think it's about the heart um, and again there's innovation but it's also 
uh, there's original innovation, meaning you're moving like sideways, but I think there's also innovation when you move deeper into a genre. Right. Yep. Right. So um, a key example is literally Stardew Valley. So um, yeah. he, he looked at it, right? And I was like, uh, how can I make my own version of um, Harvest Moon? Yep. And I think he did an amazing, amazing, amazing job. <laughs> so, yes, job absolutely. It, right. So, um, I mean, there's definitely innovation in, in the space. There's tons of it, but it's like within the genre, not outside of it as much. Uh, and I think for me, that's, that's generally what I'm looking at nowadays. Um, and maybe I have like small side projects where I do like a genre I've never tried before. Uh, but for me, in the core games that we make, it's about innovation within the genre. How can we uh, make this feel better? Uh, how can I... Uh, pull on any of the things and, and I look at narrative as part of the mechanics as well, right? How can I um, make your heart go doki doki? Yeah, quite quite literally. Oh, right? that's so, awesome. Um, I think for me, it really is, is it's in the, the small things that, that make you happy. Um, the, the initial moment of discovery is obviously amazing, but for me, it's the, the small things in the world. Um, like, example... I used to play Castlevania Symphony of the Night, right? Love, I love that, that game. game. Amazing game. Um, I mean, the game mechanically is, is all there. But I think what really sells the game for me is not the mechanics. The mechanics are, I mean, you've got a Metroidvania basically with good combat, right? But it's the setting and the vibe. And, and it's hard to put your finger on the vibe. But there were some areas in the game that were just gorgeous. Like this is Cathedral. And you've defeated a big sword enemy there. And just standing there, the music plays. And I just like sat back on the couch and like, Alucard's there, the stained glass, enjoy the vibe. Hell yeah. And it, it was amazing. Like, so I think um, a lot of us play games to experience another world or to live in another world, uh, even for a short while. And I think for me, it's that sense of living in another life that is that is key for, for game making for me. That's awesome. No, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, I think the thing that I, I love the most hearing from all of you is that, uh, you know, you, you get very deeply uh, interested in, in the specificity of the games that you're playing that sort of expands your own worldview and expands and informs your design and the, th the way you think about games. Games is not just an... Uh, inherently a, a passive act of just consuming it one way, but it's also helping you inform your own work. Um, and I want to like uh, sort of move the conversation to be a little bit more technical and sort of more uh, informative in some of the aspects of the game design work. So now that you've sort of found the thing that s sort of interests you, say it's a mechanic or an idea, and you're starting to explore it for a game, right? As you're building out this concept, how do you arrive at the thing the the special sauce that you that makes you decide okay this is this is the game this is where it's good like this is where i'm going to start the genesis of what is going to be hopefully a commercial product or a product that you put out in front of people how do you arrive at that point is there inherently a lot of play testing and or like a lot of rigorous uh, like you know pulling things apart as they say in like uh, writers rooms for TV shows they've got to break the, the story right and that is a very in, like inherently f like fervorous process so what is that like for you guys and how do you arrive like say Cuisinier at like say with the game that you just you're putting together right now and of course TFT mm. uh, why don't we start with you uh, Keen Okay, um, so for sure, playtesting. <laughs> and playtesting actually is a trickier topic than, uh, than most might think, right? Like first is the target audience, like who are you playtesting with? Um, but one thing I truly believe in is playtesting the game yourself like as a development team. There's a term in software engineering called dog fooding. So, I mean, it's basically like developers being the game that you're making and, you know, be able to look at it at a critical eye. So that is uh, one aspect. Like if you can get the team, your team excited about the, making the, playing the game that you're making, that's already a, a step towards success. Like some of my most successful playtests is when the team stay back afterward to play the game mode that we are, play, we are designing. Nice. Yeah, so those are very good indicators of success already. 
Um, then of course, when it comes to general playtesting, it's very important to not just like get anybody to playtest your game. It's important to find the correct target audience, and most importantly, being able to train the playtesters to give good feedback. Like being able to structure your questionnaire to get the feedback that you really need, rather than just random general feedback. That alone is an art, and there's a lot of like like research and training on how to do that. But uh, receiving the good feedback is actually very important because otherwise you might get sidetracked your project. You don't just do anything that the playtester tells you to do. You need to be able to pick and choose. So that is the second thing. And um, just to touch on Doki Doki. Yeah, so for me, I'm a, uh, I like to play action game, but I predominantly work on strategy game. So the feeling that we get when the play tester play our game and enjoy it is when their heart goes bado bado. Hell yeah. <laughs> Where the heartbeat adrenaline was pumping and they were like, you know, even the strategy game, I thought it's chill, relaxing, but actually when you're at, uh, driving, getting at that mastermind moment, you can really see the eyes in the play TFT change. is not a chill game though. I'll just, I just want to put it out there. <laughs> uh, when I'm trying to look for my final... Uh, Five star unit, like, uh, it's, it's a problem. Exactly, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's the adrenaline we're talking about that like, come from traditionally action game, but when you put it into a strategy game, that's where you see the source yeah, of yeah. success. The adrenaline pump, the, the, the kind of uh, excitement the player gets. Yeah. Nice, nice. How about you? Oh, I just wanted to comment on something that was like that Keen said that was I found super hilarious because he said that he's a uh, you primarily you primarily play action game, but you're building a strategy games. Yeah. yeah but I'm like the reverse. Oh snap. I, I only play strategy games. Yeah, and I'm building an action game now. Is your game really yeah. an? Act? I mean, yeah, we we can get into the the, the yeah. Well, okay, we'll get into the, the semantics the, of the that. The of it. Yes. Yeah, but but that's uh, the, the interesting thing that I found uh, with with my game. Um, so with the process of like like uh, deciding that game, I think um, I have a lot of prototypes. Like okay. I have like um, easily I think like fifty odd like prototypes just sitting in my desktop. And you're just like tinkering away. Yeah, as I mean like know. every yeah. every weekend or every like time I have an idea, I just pop up like uh, Godot or something, and then I just like scribble out a, a prototype, just put it in, and then like uh, play test it myself and chuck it away. And I think like one of these things that um, the earliest start of a game is usually an idea, and you, you do a prototype, and then I for certain prototypes that I think have potential, I let people play it. Nice. And then it's the same thing that what Keen said. So like, if people play it and you can see the look on their face, whether they're just humoring you or like they are genuinely like, wait, can I, one more time, just just go one more time. Let me just try. I'm pretty sure I can. So that actually happened with Glyphica. Oh, like, that's awesome. Quite often. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that was some. That was when I was like, wait, okay, I think there's something here. I just need to like see if I, like that's the next step, right? Where is there enough content for me to make so that this could become of value right, to right. someone who would then dish out money for it. That's usually my primary concern because a lot of my, like, uh, the, the things I think of on at night, they tend to have, uh, they tend to be good ideas, good systems, but they are devoid of any content. So the, the content is what usually people, once people are sold on the idea, the content is actually what they pay for. For sure. Yeah. So so then like it, I then becomes like a lot of research, like just playing all of the typing games out there and try to figure out like okay exactly what worked for these games, what didn't, like why are most typing games like on uh, on on the web and free, uh, like why then there are isn't there more like a uh, uh, paid typing games? For right. Example. Right. Right. And then once I have determined that uh, there is enough content to turn this into a product of value, I will then need to find out what is my bet. So usually, you, 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 for every game, there is a reason why it isn't, uh, like that you think it will work, yes. and a reason why you think it will eventually fail, right? So I think for typing games, for me, like I, my bet is that if I find the audience who is not actually on Steam, they're kind of scattered all over the world, uh, all over the internet, they're playing typing games. They're playing uh, typing games on like uh, mobile, uh, on like uh, websites, like H.io and others. H.io. Like, yeah. So if I can find enough, like just a fraction of these, then this game can make a profit. Okay. So okay. that was my bet. Like, That's interesting. Like if I can single it down to one bet, uh, and then the like, that becomes a viable product for me. That's cool. Yeah. That's so cool. So that is how I sort of started that from a very technical point of view. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. From a very technical point of view. Yeah, I don't know if that's sufficient. No, that's yeah. no, that's awesome. I and 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 to to bounce it off to Sean because I know Cuisinier's genesis is also very interesting, and I would love to hear your thoughts on how that came about. Okay, so I think uh, there's two parts. One part will be quite familiar to what 
um, was mentioned. Although I just have to say, hey, Shen Ming, I've played some of those prototypes from 10 years ago, and some of them would have been really successful commercial games. Damn, okay. Um, so I wish he'd finished more of them, but yeah. Um, okay, so I think uh, we've talked enough about like the personal playtesting and personal excitement or internal team buy-in. Uh, so we definitely do a lot of that as well. Uh, but I think less of what was discussed was the formal market research. Mm. Um, so um, I think s some people who know of Battle Brew definitely know about Cuisineer, uh, but they might not know of the game right before Cuisineer, uh, which is called Noodle Superstar. <laughs> so, uh, Noodle Superstar, unfortunately, is cancelled. Uh, and whereas Cuisinia was an action roguelite with cooking, uh, Noodle Superstar was a cooking game with PvP. Um, it's the other way around. It's like Cooking Mama, but versus <laughs> competitive Cooking Mama. Um, there's some legal things I can't mention. Um, basically, a party picked it up and a party dropped it. Uh, but the genre was risky, right? So that was a huge lesson there. And to be fair, we did do our market research, um, which is about where I'm, I'm going to talk about, right? But um, the genre, for example, Noodle Superstar was dominated by Cooking Mama and not much else. That's true. That's so, true. So you either become the next Cooking Mama or you make nothing. Um, and on the other hand, Cuisinier was... Um, commercially, commercially um, and, and big picture, so you take a few steps back, right? Um, most decent roguelikes will do decently well. You, you will not go bankrupt. So it's actually a safer bet from a purely commercial POV sort of view. Uh, please take whatever I say with a pinch of salt. They're not absolute rules. Um, but that's, that's generally how I think some of the publishers uh, look at some of these, right? So you look at things like market floor, uh, market uh, cap if there's a cap or well, you got to see generally how high they go but if you look at like say cooking games versus roguelikes roguelikes generally on the whole for sure have a bigger audience and generally do better on the whole uh, whereas like a cooking game is risky so I get that right uh, so I think that's the formal market research bit how do you do this as an indie or even honestly how do some of the publishers do it very simple you go to game analytics or like Steam Spy, look at yep. games that might be the genre that your game is in. Please don't just look at the top games, look at the bottom games as well. Yep. And then like very honestly try and rate where your game would come in. And very realistically, you will fall somewhere in between. For sure. Uh, pay attention to art style as well. So uh, there's definitely been cases where exact same game, um, exact same mechanics, different art style, bam vast difference in, yep. in sales, right? Yes. Uh, so you got to look at the theme, you got to look at the art style, you got to look at mechanics, all of the above. Uh, mind you, this is all saying that there's a commercial component to it. If you are making a game only for yourself or for art, then by all means, go make whatever your heart tells you and skip the commercial bit. But if you ever want to make money off games, then you do have to make sure that there's enough of an audience and yes. you got the audience bet right. Yep. Um, and then, and then, I mean, that, that's important to get right even before your marketing because if that audience isn't big enough, then there just aren't going to be enough streamers to cover your game. Versus on the other hand, if like it's a, it's a genre that people like, it's an art style that people like, uh, the game has streamable qualities, then bam, all of the above comes true, possibly. No, that's awesome. I, you know, like I think what it comes down to is making games is not easy, um, and the act of finding the game is a long road uh, that people need to be persistent with and you can get very smart about it especially with doing market research uh, player research uh, but it also comes down to like some sort of level of persistence because you've got to figure it out and find it and, and enjoy that process because up, everyone wants a finished product that they want to put out and say that they're a game developer but getting to that point takes a lot of work um, in the interest of time, you know, I, I want to make sure that if there's any uh, opportunity for the audience to ask anything, they can do so. But I've just got a few more, uh, like you know, questions to wrap this up. Uh, one is, and I think this is very prescient because you guys talked about, you know, your upbringing. You talked about Chinese to some degree. You talked about, you know, the the way uh, your 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 uh, childhoods have uh, informed your your careers. Now, how do you guys see culture? 
and I think this is a question. This is a topic that comes up a lot, especially with respect to game the games made outside of the Western sphere, right? Uh, especially when it comes to be talking about Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, this is a very hot topic. Obviously, uh, do you feel like culture is a very important thing for people to consider as they infuse it into their games, whether that's uh, Obvious and like apparent, especially when it, you, you talk about cultural markers that appear, like whether that's through narrative or game design or art, or is that something that they don't have, they should worry less about and we should worry about the game first? Um, I'll just go. Yes. Um, I think my view is that unless you are setting out uh, specifically to build a game with a specific culture in mind. Uh, who you are, and that includes the culture you were brought up in, leaks into the game anyway. Um, so, I mean, Cuisina definitely featured Singaporean food. It's a, it's a game about food, right? So, um, we didn't have to think very hard about what we loved, right? So, obviously, local food made it in. And it was nice seeing international streamers play the game and ask questions like, what is Roti Prata? <laughs> um, and then and then they find out more about Southeast Asian food, right? So that was that was cool, um, but I I don't think necessarily you. I mean, I th you need to have a good game first, right? Um, but I do think whoever you are will leak into the game anyway. Right. Um, so let's talk about like some Korean games. So I played them growing up, right? Uh, so example, like I played MU Online and a whole oh, bunch man. of other yes, like Korean Early games, MMOs. right? And uh, one one Korean theme in some of the games is, which you might not think of as Korean at first, is there'll be some angel character and there'll be some devil character somewhere. That's go true. Like, Wait, how's that Korean, Sean? Go like, yeah, but as a trend, you notice it, right? Like yeah, a lot yeah, of like, yeah, these, yeah, these yeah, Korean yeah, games, yeah. Like, bam, you got angel wings, devil wings, and then like somebody with like, oh, both powers at the same time. And you go like, what? Why is this a trend? Yeah. Uh, and then even the way they design their art, the, the art style, you can look at this one and go like, ah, oh, that's, that's Japanese. Korean. Oh, that's Korean. I yeah. mean, that's Korean style art. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this one is the Chinese take on anime. So um, even the, the subtle differences will be there. The sensibilities, and, yeah. Yeah, if you're a fan, you will notice like the differences. So I think um, if you make your games, uh, weirdly, the word I use is sincerely, right? Um, who you are, and that includes your culture, will bleed into the game anyway, which is not a bad thing at all. Sure. Um, there's definitely like, I mean, they're, they're broad overarching themes. So again, like take what I say with a pinch of salt, but there's definitely like more Japanese style game design and there's like American style game design. There's like generally what you call like American style art direction. And there's, you know, example, Japanese. I mean, not everything's anime, but like there's a Japanese yeah. art style direction and it's, it's these little subtleties. So, uh, I mean, yeah, so I'm wearing like a Bloodborne t-shirt, right? Shout out to Bloodborne. Great game. Um, but you'll notice that um, even the settings, you know, um, Victorian horror at first, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of Japanese influences seep in anyway yeah. in, into the games. Uh, I mean, obviously, not just the weapons or whatever, but like even the way the, some of the narrative is done, there's a, there's a sensitivity to it. For sure. Uh, so I think... Just make your game sincerely, yeah. And who you are will be expressed in the thing that you make. That's awesome. I love that. Any anything else to add, you guys? Uh, for me, I would just be super quick. I think that um, ultimately is execution. Uh, how you uh, include the kind of uh, diverse culture in your game. The execution is actually very important. Right. Of course. Yeah. You don't want it to look forced and sort of like you no know, to mark some sort of checklist. For it to happen, it needs to be sincere. It needs to be something that is true. But one thing I will add is that actually it's very important. Like sometimes traditional, like you no, know, in the the bad way to interpret market data could be that okay, this is so popular, we are going to do the popular thing, and then you sort of neglect the smaller culture, the niche culture here and there. Like Singapore, how many Singaporeans are there in the world? Like zero point one percent or zero point zero zero one percent. Like why would you showcase Singaporean uh, culture in your game? It doesn't make sense market research wise. Okay. But actually, this is uh. The other way to look at it is that actually it's an opportunity in two ways. First, you being able to showcase this to the rest of the world and get people curious about our culture. 100%. This is new to people. They would like it. They would like to be exposed to it and see how it's like. Then the second thing is that because it's niche, right, the people who really like it, 
uh, they will feel very appreciated. They will love it. Like when the Overwatch character was Singaporean, Echo, it, feel, it makes me feel something, you know, like it feels like, okay, I want to play this character, see how it's like. And then people will really like it a lot more because they are part of the culture. They see what you do there. And the way to execute it to achieve that kind of like uh, emotion is when it's done sincerely. Like in uh, Riot, we have some uh, Filipino character. We, when we do that uh, Zari, we did not actually include a lot of stereotypes about Filipino stuff. For sure. But uh, we have subtle things that make Filipino only, they will realize that, oh, that is, that is um, a reference that they can understand in that culture. Yep. And they resonate a lot with that kind of thing. So ultimately, I think that uh, culture is very important and um, uh, minority culture is also very important. And it's actually very important to be considerable about, considerate like, how you're going to execute that yep. in the game. Yeah. That's awesome. Anything to add? Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm probably the, the least qualified person to talk about culture simply because like all the games I've made so far, uh, at least in Paradox and also my own game, are culturally agnostic. Okay. So <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a point yeah, of view. I mean, like, uh, like view. Stellaris is star sci-fi. Yes, uh, I know. And, and, like, uh, and, and for my uh, typing game, Glyphica, it's one thing I do say about culture is that because I think the art style is minimalist, yes. which is actually very sort of um, it's very Asian it's very it's Asian yeah. and, and, and it's very sort of like uh, it has it's adjacent to Japanese art like uh, sure. like we we have a lot of traction in Japan okay and that is completely like for me like surprising because like That's I sick. did not do any sort of marketing yeah. in that region but the Japanese people really liked it and they picked it up and they shared it and they like tweet about it and I think that is something that can only come up because of that adjacent Right, the, like the culturally adjacent uh, stuff that we have in the game. So I think it is important. Uh, but I think, right, for me personally, I tend to do culturally adja uh, like agnostic games uh, that can apply to as many people as possible, um, which obviously don't 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 get the kind of like um, like benefits that having like right. culturally specific games do. Uh. Yeah, but, but I do think. I mean, so I, I've seen the game. I haven't played the game yet, but I think it really is. You're able to tell the sincerity of the game dev. And I think the Japanese people like it precisely because it embodies some of the minimalist Zen cultural aesthetics, right? Yeah. So, so they get that. Yeah. And that's exactly, I think, my point um, of like, if you make it sincerely, who you are is expressed and what people feel kinship with, they'll pick yeah. up. So like in Cuisine, for example, uh, Singapore food is surprisingly popular in Tokyo. So yeah. you have a lot of Japanese yeah. streamers yeah. going, ah, laksa, and you're just like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, you guys like laksa. Every time you bring up a merlion, the Japanese love it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I, we're, almost, we're almost at time. I think we're like down to like two or three minutes. So, oh, one minute. All right, so I'm, I'm going to wrap this up uh, nice and neat. Uh, thank you very much again, guys, for being here and sharing your insights. I hope you guys found it informative because I certainly did. Uh, I asked all the questions that I, I, I just wanted to learn from you guys. So uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your perspectives. I hope this was super fun for you guys too. Uh, in any case, for all of you, uh, if you want to find these guys, they're probably still roaming the show floor for the next hour or so. Uh, also, go check out the games at the back there. There's some really cool stuff to see. Hopefully, that'll get you uh, buzzed for some game design uh, inspirations. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>